So Dr. Stephen Friedland um, is director of the Center of Integrated Research in Cancer and Lifestyle and co-director of the Cancer Genetics and Prevention Program and associate director for faculty development at the Samuel, Samuel Ocean Comprehensive Cancer Institute at Cedar sinai in LA, California. Uh, fac you're also a faculty physician in the Division of Urology at Cedar sinai Surgery Department, and your approach toward cancer prevention and awareness focuses on treating the whole patient, not just the disease, by combining traditional Western medicine with complementary holistic uh, interventions. Dr. Friedland has published over 400 studies and um, Dr. Friedland's clinical expertise focuses on urological diseases, uh, particularly benign prostatic hyperplasia and prostate cancer. And then Dr. Philip Chang is an oncology rehabilitation medicine staff physician at Cedar sinai uh, also in LA. And Dr. Chang received his medical education from the Michigan State College of Osteopathic Medicine followed by a residency in physical medicine and rehabilitation at SUNY downstate in Brooklyn, New York. Following residency, um, he completed fellowship in hospice and palliative care at Montfiore Medical Center and recently finished a fellowship in the emerging field of cancer rehabilitation at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's a board certified physician in physical medicine and rehabilitation and holds membership in the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and is an active member of the Cancer Rehabilitation Physician Consortium. So thank you so much, gentlemen, and I will turn things over to you. Great, great. thank you so much. And um, so I'm gonna go first. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you today. And, and I, I do realize it's, it's a little unusual to have a urologist, uh, someone who really specializes in prostate cancer, talk to you today about thyroid cancer, uh, but it's really the other hat that I wear, not as a urologist, but as someone interested in integrative medicine, lifestyle, nutrition, and its role in cancer, and I actually run a group that is called the Center for Integrated Research on Cancer and Lifestyle Circle. And it's not P-Circle, it's not Prostate Circle. We do all kinds of cancer and, and we're not doing a lot in thyroid, but that we're involved in breast cancer and liver cancer and, and brain tumors and obviously prostate and others. So I, I have learned um, about cancers beyond prostate. Um, and unfortunately we don't learn a lot about nutrition in thyroid cancer. So a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about is just generalized cancer. Um, and there will be plenty of um, time to ask questions. And I'm looking, yes, I will make sure that the organizers have a copy of my slides and that they can be sent out to whoever wants. There's nothing proprietary about it. Um, so if we look at the estimated number of cancers, new cancer diagnoses in the US, what you see is thyroid cancer here in women is more common in women. And it's the fifth most common cancer diagnosed in women. It doesn't break the top 10 in men. I think it's pretty close on the top 10, but number five in women. This is new cases. But if you look at mortality, death from prostate cancer, death from cancer, sorry, slip old habits, um, you see thyroid is not on the list. So it does not break the top 10. So even though it's the fifth most common, it's not in the top 10 for mortality. So what does that tell us? What that tells us is relative to other cancers that the risk of dying with thyroid cancer is low. It doesn't mean that people don't die of it. doesn't mean it can't be very aggressive, but just relative to other cancers, the risk of dying of the cancer is lower. So the end result is more people are surviving the cancer, which is a wonderful thing. But then as you survive cancer, questions come up of what am I supposed to be doing? How am I supposed to live? What's my long-term risks of other complications and problems? And so this creates the, the opportunities to, to study this and understand this, but it creates some of the challenges in terms of how do we keep people who've had thyroid cancer, how do we keep them healthy and around for, for a long time? And one of the questions that you know we're often asked is, is cancer the result of genetics and bad luck? Is it, you know, at the end of the day, it is all your parents' fault or something bad luck? And I would say not necessarily. I think there's a lot of data that, that bad luck does play into cancer. You could 
have chosen the right parents that genetically gave you no cancer risk factors, you eat right, you exercise, you, do, you don't smoke, you do everything right, and you can still get cancer. So we can't 100% avoid it, but I think there are factors um, that do play into it that it's a nature and nurture situation. And so in terms of thyroid cancer, um, it does occur a little bit earlier in women than men, again, more common in women than men. Um, obviously, there are, when we think about um, certain types of cancers, biology certainly plays a role. Women have certain organs, ovaries um, that men don't. Men have prostates that women don't. Um, and that can, you know, understanding that biologically can help us understand why other cancers, which are present in both men and women, may be influenced. And so we see, in, again, thyroid is three times more common in women. Breast cancer is 100 times more common. You might think, well, what do you mean 100 times? Is it only in women? No, men can actually get breast cancer. Um, men, we see more bladder and kidney cancers. So as we think about some of the factors here, there, there's certainly risk factors for thyroid cancer that you can't easily change. Um, your genetics, there's certainly some abnormal genes that hereditary thyroid cancers, um, inherited conditions, um, race, thyroid cancer is most common in Caucasians and then followed by the Latinx and Asian, Native Americans and African Americans. They're, they're at higher risk for many cancers, actually lower risk for thyroid cancer. And as we start to think about some of the modifiable risk factors, socioeconomic status is, is in theory modifiable. It's not so easy to move up your socioeconomic status, but it, it is not necessarily an innate feature. It's not your genetics or your race. Um, and there's certainly, you know, exposures to radiation, less insurance, healthcare um, can drive certain disparities. But when we start to think about lifestyle factors, again, really thinking more just in general uh, for cancer, um, you know, tobacco use, poor nutrition, physical inactivity, you're going to hear a lot more about that from Dr. Chang, stress, isolation, you can get natural exposure, sunlight can cause a lot of cancers, melanoma, uh, radon gas, certainly medical treatments, um, radiation just from CT scans can increase cancer risk very, very slightly, um, but certainly me some medicines cause it. We know there's a lot of chemical exposures in, in the um, workplace and household, pollution in the air and water, and certainly viruses can cause cancer as well. Um, but when we really start to think about, you know, the, the, the classic modifiable diet lifestyle things. You, the first, you start to think about tobacco and alcohol. And both of those are linked with increased cancer risk and cancer recurrence. And importantly, for survivors of cancer, they're linked with increased risk of secondary cancers. So just because you've had thyroid and been treated and cured, that's wonderful. But by the fact that you have one cancer, you're at higher risk of developing a second cancer, whether that be a breast, a prostate, a colon, something else. So we've got to think not just thyroid, but we've got to think about other cancers as well. And that's where cutting uh, down on alcohol, eliminating tobacco, because tobacco use explains almost 20% of all cancers. So one out of almost every five cancers diagnosed in the US is due to tobacco use. Alcohol use, more alcohol, higher cancer risk. It's been linked with at least six different types of cancer. And, you know, this question of, well, I just have one drink a day, probably okay. There's probably a little bit of cardiovascular benefits in terms of lowering cholesterol and reducing stress and different things. Um, you know, that, um, you know, but there is increased cancer risk. So those tend to balance out. So zero to one drinks a day, probably doesn't affect overall survival, but it's more than one drink a day, the cancer risks really start to win out. So if you are drinking, I would really try to limit it to one a day. Um, so doc doctor, there is a question uh, that asked if um, cannabis use could increase or decrease the risk slash severity of cancer. Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, the short answer is we don't know. Um, I mean, traditionally cannabis was joints and smoking and you get uh, factors in that, carbon monoxide and different things, that there would be carcinogens in that. Um, now, certainly living here in California, it's, it's legal, um, many other states as well. 
Um, so in terms of if you're not smoking it, you don't get that inhalation. Um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, there's, there's a lot of interest in, in research in looking at uh, cannabinoids. Um, so more the CBD side of the cannabinoids. I mean, uh, you know, cannabis, you know, marijuana can actually break down to THC, which has the psychotropic effects and, and the high, if you will. But cannabis is the CBD side of things. There's actually interest in using that as therapies for certain cancers. Um, not to say there's great data on that by any stretch, but I'm saying there is interest in that. So I, I think the short answer is we don't know. So that, that, that's how I would leave it is we don't know. And, and then another question came in on alcohol. Can some alcohol be useful? So what I would say is there's really not situations where alcohol is useful. Um, you do get a little bit of cardiac benefits, lowering, um, you're raising HDL cholesterol, which is your good cholesterol. It relaxes you. So that's good for your heart, but it does raise cancer risk. If you're in the zero to one drink a day, those risks kind of balance each other out in that the, the net result is no effect, but above one drink a day, certainly the cancer risks went out and people drinking more than one drink a day actually live shorter than people drinking no drinks or one drink a day. So I wouldn't say it's beneficial. I would say up to one drink a day is okay. So. And, and another question is, um, you know, even though there's no research say on diet as related to thyroid cancer or specifically medullary thyroid cancer, is, is that a reason to believe that diet and lifestyle have no effect? No, I, I would say actually, I do think they have an effect and I'll, I'll show you in a second. Certainly we know obesity is linked with increased risk of thyroid. And I, and I get it that thyroid is not, I see the comment there is not one type of cancer, it's different subtypes. We see that with all different cancers. Um, you know, every cancer is now broken down into multiple subtypes. And so again, not being a thyroid expert, which I freely admit, um, I, my understanding is we, we certainly need more research about which subtypes are, are associated with obesity and what that tells us about the biology. But as a global whole, We'll see in a second, obesity is linked with thyroid cancer, suggesting there probably is lifestyle, metabolic, dietary components that just haven't been well studied. So there's a specific question about what's on the bottom of your slide. It says, why is the alcohol use uh, linked to six different cancers? Is it only due to thyroid cancer or can it be different cancers, breast, thyroid, et cetera? No, it's, it's six different types. So, I mean, it's linked with breast, it's linked with liver. I think it's esophageal. Um, there's some question about prostate. Um, I don't think it's specifically been linked with thyroid. Um, but again, you know, people who've had thyroid and been treated for thyroid are at risk for other cancers. So it's really not a situation where I can recommend someone drink alcohol. Again, okay. I'm they allow a patient. I mean, patients can do what they want, fair enough. But if they're asking my advice, I say, it's, I think it's reasonable to do up to one drink a day, but I don't recommend it. If you choose to do it, that's up to you, but I don't recommend alcohol really for anything. So just a time check, you're at about your halfway point for your half hour. Okay, um, let's keep going through. I see a question about some supplements, but let's get through because I wanna get through to talk about some of the obesity stuff because I think that's really, probably a very important topic. So in terms of being overweight, um, the suggestion is by 2045, overweight will overtake smoking as the number one modifiable risk factor for cancer prevention. And there's a lot of mechanisms by which obesity may drive cancer, but it turns out one of them that's actually pretty interesting and cool as you get into biology is fat cells themselves make hormones. And those hormones and factors will go to different organs in the body and make the cells grow faster. And the more fast cells grow, the more opportunity there is that they're replicating their DNA. There's opportunities to make mistakes. And when that happens, you can get a tumor. Uh, obesity also drives inflammation, which creates DNA damage, which again can lead to mistakes and can lead to tumors. And so when we look at the 13 different types of cancer that are associated with 
obesity and being overweight, which you see is thyroid up there, um, is one of them. Prostate, which I study is not, even though I'd argue strongly that it is, it's more fatal prostate cancer, but nonetheless, unequivocally, according to the American, uh, the International Association of Research on Cancer, um, that thyroid is linked, uh, that obesity is linked with thyroid cancer. So um, one of these things, uh, you know, if we exclude colorectal, which to screening and different things is going down, the incidence of these cancers is going up. The overweight obesity, we see obesity rates going up. They're getting more common in younger cancers. And if we actually look in women, it explains almost 50, over 50% 50 of all cancers in women can be explained by obesity and a quarter of all cancers in men. So really in terms of one of the first things that I, when I talk to people is try to lose weight and keep the weight down. Um, I see a lot of questions, but I, I'm gonna uh, keep going just so we can get through the talk and we'll get to the questions as best we can. So in terms of recommendations, quit smoking. There's no benefits to smoking whatsoever. Avoid cigarettes. If you smoke, stop. Um, if you don't smoke, don't start. Um, alcohol, here we say two drinks a day. I really try to keep it one drink a day. Um, it's kind of a limit. Uh, and so really, again, quitting smoking. Um, in terms of diet and exercise, you're going to hear more about exercise. There you see it kind of in the bowl, maintain a healthy weight. So um, I think the easiest way to maintain a healthy weight is to limit simple sugars. Um, when you talk to dietitians, and my sister's a dietitian, I study this field, we all see the world through our own rose-colored glasses and, and have different views about nutrition. There's not a single dietitian I know out there or a single dietary pattern or cookbook or anything that says add more sugar. That is the one thing that dietitians across the board, whether you're a low carb, whether you're keto, whether you're a vegan, whether you're whatever your persuasion is of diet, I think they all probably work well. Nobody says add more sugar. So I think that's the one really simple message that I try to give to my patients is avoiding sugar, cookies, cakes, sodas, candies, along those lines, avoiding processed foods. So really, if you're thinking about going to the grocery store and shopping, you shop on the outside of the grocery store. That's where your fruits, your vegetables, your meats, your cheeses, and different things are. It's not in the middle. If you're buying it from a box, it's probably processed. If you're buying something that actually looks like something that grew in nature, whether it's a meat, a, a vegetable, or something, that's uh, a, you know a, a whole food in that sense. Try as much as possible to move towards whole food, less ultra-processed foods. The more ingredients it has, the more it's processed. So simple ways, again, is reading food labels, choosing those with fewer ingredients, sticking to whole foods, whole grains, not seeds, beans, vegetables, fruits, uh, meats, ideally uh, wild animals eating their natural diet. So not farmed fish, you know, uh, grass-fed beef, different things as much as possible. Um, there's not a lot of studies on thyroid cancer and diet. Um, the ones that have been generally will say the Western diet, which is high in fat and high carb, high processed food really is associated with increased risk. So there's at least a half a dozen studies I saw and looking through that all kind of condemn this Western diet, which really to me says, I don't see anything super unique out there that, oh, this particular food is great for thyroid, but not for other cancers. It's generally this recommendation of eating whole foods, limiting sugar, trying to get to a normal body weight and exercise, which you'll hear more on the next. Um, I'm gonna skip this just for time. Um, one thing that is becoming more common in thyroid cancer, um, you guys are, are learning from prostate, it's, it's nice to see, is active surveillance. And this idea um, that not every thyroid cancer needs to be treated. I know it's still kind of out there a little bit, but it is starting to happen. And for me, what I do with my prostate patients, which active surveillance is very common, is active surveillance plus. Basically, the idea is, your yes, you have cancer. Yes, it's extremely low risk. The risks of treating it are greater than the risk of the tumor spreading. Ergo, you're probably not going to die of the cancer. 
So what is the most likely threat to your life? It's heart disease. So let's focus on getting your heart, let's getting uh, your, your weight under control, getting you exercising, getting better sleep, different things. The one thing that is unique to um, thyroid is that there is uh, radioactive iodine treatments uh, that patients undergo for thyroid cancer. Again, I'm not gonna get into the nuances of where it's used. I'm not a thyroid expert, um, but usually it's about two to three weeks long. And the idea is during that time, you wanna be on a low thyroid diet. Um, so there are websites that do that, but you wanna avoid iodized salt, meat and dairy products, grains and cereals, uh, ocean fish, shellfish, um, we, uh, you know, seaweeds, commercially prepared baked goods, FTC red dye number three, which is a new one to me, and then egg yolks. So those will be kind of the dietary advice. Um, I have up here my email address. I will leave it up for a few minutes, my Twitter handle um, that you can uh, email me, shout out me on Twitter if you have questions. But I think we have a, a couple minutes to get through some questions. Yep, there's a couple there. How do you feel okay. about uh, supplements such as mushrooms, magnesium, and vitamin D? So I would say in general, they're not well studied. The studies that have looked at supplements find if you're taking more than one supplement a day, most of those people are at actually increased risk of getting a, of cancer. So one supplement, a general Centrum Silver type situation, Centrum, is going to be more than enough. Ideally, you're really getting it from a, a whole food based diet. Vitamin D does have some intriguing data for several different cancers. Um, I think that's reasonable to do. Not a lot of downside that I can see. Uh, vitamin D is fat soluble, meaning if you just take it in the morning um, with some cereal and, and some you know um, skim milk, you're not actually going to absorb any of the vitamin D. You got to eat it when you're eating a fatty meal to actually be able to absorb the vitamin D. There's a couple of questions that maybe you're connected here. Um, one would be: Is cancer more common? Uh, in men or women, and another one that uh, is it true that men with thyroid cancer are more likely to present with more advanced and aggressive um, disease and have a poorer prognosis? So, in terms of cancers, I think it's more common in men, but it, it depends on the cancer. Obviously, prostate very common in men, breast very common in women. Um, a lot of the other cancers are relatively equal. Um, in terms of the thyroid, and is it more aggressive? I will have to defer to a thyroid expert. I'm gonna pass on that one. <laughs> um, how about the keto diet? Is that okay for thyroid cancer patients? So my impression in, in, of what thyroid is, I would say yes, it's not been studied to my knowledge. It's actually a big interest of mine. We've studied it or, or low carb, which is a version of keto. We studied it for brain tumor, prostate, uh, pre-liver cancer, and studying it for breast. That's, that's actually a big interest of mine. I think the metabolic changes with keto, lowering insulin level, generally losing weight, all of those things should have health benefits. Um, we're actually looking at may actually reduce heart disease risk, reduces metabolic syndrome, diabetes. All of those should be good for thyroid. So in the absence of data, my opinion is yes, it should be good for thyroid, but again, not been studied to my knowledge. Is there any link between drinking more coffee and getting cancer? So that's been looked at and actually the short answer is essentially no. Um, I think coffee is safe. It does cause um, some, it can irritate the bladder. So it can cause some increased urinary frequency and urgency. Um, but other than that, it's a relatively safe uh, thing in standard doses, anything in super high doses, I would worry about, but a few cups a day, I think you're fine. If, um, if you're undergoing active surveillance with um, thyroid cancer, is it better to consume more or less iodine to prevent nodule growth? It's a great question. I do not know the answer to that. Uh, I would assume that it probably does not matter uh, dramatically. Um, in that the, the idea is you have a thyroid mass or tumor and it's growing pretty slow. I'm not aware of data linking thyroid iodine intake to tumor growth, but again, I'm not a thyroid expert. So I would really defer to kind of one of our thyroid experts on that. 
How about uh, antioxidant supplements um, after undergoing radioactive iodine treatment? So, you know, in terms of radioactive iodine, so radiation works by creating oxidants. That's how radiation works. It creates oxidants, which then kill tumor cells. So in other tumor types, there are data that if you take antioxidants while undergoing radiation, you do negate the benefits of radiation. Hmm. So without knowing the specific answer for a thyroid, I would advise against taking antioxidants while getting radiation or in the short period thereafter. Kind of two questions that are real similar. One is, um, what do you think is the most important foods to include? And one would be, what, what's the one nutrition tip that you'd pass on to your patients? So most important foods to include, I would say, is whole foods. Um, I don't, you know, we, we hear about superfoods. I'm not a huge fan of that concept. I don't think, oh, I ate my broccoli today, therefore I'm invincible. I'm, I, you know, it doesn't work that way. I and mean, just because you had a good eating day doesn't mean you can slouch off the next day. Um, so I, I think it's, it's every day continuing to eat well. What I focus in on my patients is eating better. And, you know, I, I remember a conversation with a patient, for example, he was asked, is it okay to eat whole wheat crackers? And I, I tend to push a little bit more towards the low carbs. I wasn't thrilled with, with the, the, it wasn't even whole wheat. It was, I think, just regular crackers. And, you know, so I wasn't thrilled by it, but I asked the next question, which to me is the important question. Well, if you didn't eat the crackers as your snack, what would you eat instead? Saying, right. he might say like a salad or, you know, maybe I'll have some nuts. So his answer was, well, if I don't have the crackers, I can eat some Oreos. I'm like, have the crackers, please have the crackers. So it's, it's all a matter of what's relative. If you go to, you know, take out some food from the pantry, you know, if I don't eat this, what am I gonna eat instead? easiest way to avoid these is don't buy them. Don't put them in the home. Um, you know, really try to be whole foods. The simplest advice I give to patients is avoid the sugar, the cookies, the cakes, the candies, the sodas, uh, the fruit juices, um, just avoid it as much as possible. And, you know, if you, if you want a bowl of ice cream, it's your, it's on a Saturday night, you know, my, my classic line is if you want a bowl of ice cream on Sunday, by all means have a Sunday, but don't have it also on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, a little bit to the joy of life, a little bit in moderation is fine. Just do not overdo it. So what's a good uh, sugar substitute? Uh, the best sugar substitute, I would say, is to try and avoid sugar and sugar substitutes and retrain your taste buds to appreciate more natural sugars, such as you get in fruit that also have a lot of fiber in them. And so you actually don't absorb the sugar. Sugar substitutes can um, trick the body. And there's actually some data that say that can actually induce problems with insulin levels and get you even more hooked on sugar early in the experiments with those. But I would try to avoid sugar or sugar substitutes. And actually, if you give up sugar, your taste buds do change over the course of a few weeks. It takes some time, but they actually do change. Any benefits to um, a plant-based diet? Absolutely. I think a plant-based diet is a great option. And, and I don't, to me, I think the key thing is I don't think there is one single answer for diet. There's not, this is the holy grail. This is the only approach that works. I think a plant-based diet is one of those great options. But I caution of how you interpret a plant-based diet may be different than someone else. And for example, I look at a Twinkie. There is no meat in a Twinkie. So it's easy for someone to say a Twinkie is a plant-based diet. I'm not eating meat. I'm, doing, I'm being healthy. And I think we, we have that. We, we tell people eat less fat. And they go out and eat sugar, you know, um, fat-free ice cream. I'm being healthy. You know, I'm eating fat-free ice cream every day. Look at that. And forget the sugar. So I think we need to plant-based um, a whole food Plant-based, I like a lot. Just plant-based, I worry how it's implemented. And I want to make sure we leave enough time. I, I would love to answer these all day. I just want to make sure yeah. we have Dr. Chang here. Yep, I agree. Um, because we're 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 kind of at that halfway point. So it's probably time yeah. to switch gears. And again, my email is there. 
Um, I will make sure you guys have my slides and everything. This is great. Thank you for, for all the questions. Again, I, I could do this all day long. Thank you so much. We so appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. I will sign Thank up. Thank you. What I have to do, I have yeah, can you, you have to switch um, to, to Dr. Chang as the host. Um, and then he'll have to switch to me at the end so I can end the meeting. But he'll need, you'll need to do that so he can share his slides. All right. I'm going to stop sharing. And then how do I do this really quick? Um, if you just click on uh, Dr. Chang's, um, like his name there in the Make host. There you yes. go. There you do go. you want to change the host to Philip Chang? Yes. You did it. It's done. All right. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Okay. I am sharing my screen now. Um, yep. Is everybody seeing what I'm seeing? Yes. Perfect. Um, here we go. Um, okay. So uh, that was a really great talk. We're going to be kind of switching gears a little bit here into. Uh, uh, really discussing the benefits of therapeutic um, exercise in cancer. Um, so just a quick disclaimer, this presentation is intended for informational purposes only and should not be taken um, as individualized medical advice um, and specific exercise recommendations and precautions should be discussed with your healthcare providers indicated. Um, I do not have any disclosures. Um, so really quickly, the objectives that I kind of want to cover today will be to uh, recognize the benefits of therapeutic exercise. Uh, to do to discuss uh, precautions um, uh, for potentially engaging in a therapeutic exercise program and to review uh, exercise intensity targets um, that we should be uh, reaching during our, our sessions. Um, so, you know, the question is, should I be exercising? And of course, you know, the answer for basically everybody is yes. Uh, we know that we know that exercise is good. Um, but kind of the more pertinent question is, should I be exercising even if I have cancer? And um, what we're going to be um, seeing is that in general, um, the answer is still a resounding uh, yes, as there are numerous demonstrated benefits um, that we'll be talking about in terms of cancer uh, prevention, decreasing risk of mortality, um, in addition to improving various metrics in uh, quality of life. Um, so uh, it's known, um, and there's been quite a bit of research actually, that uh, um, exercise um, has been correlated um, with preventing uh, certain kinds of cancer. So uh, for bladder, breast, colon, endometrial, esophageal, kidney, and stomach cancer, um, there have all been, uh, it's, it's been demonstrated there, there are uh, risk reductions for um, not getting these kinds of cancer. So um, for thyroid, there isn't as much um, out there for that. Um, but uh, for you know the, the re these remaining malignancies, we, we know that it does definitely help. Um, uh, in addition, we know that there is an increased survival benefit um, uh, if you have uh, either breast, colon, or prostate cancer. And these numbers are actually quite significant um, with a 48% um, decrease um, in all cause mortality for breast cancer patients, 42% in colon cancer patients, um, and um, 37 to 49% in prostate cancer patients. Now, we don't know specifically um, if these um, mortality benefits um, relate to other kinds of cancer, including uh, thyroid cancer, um, but uh, there just has not been as much research done in, in that arena yet. Um, now, um, in terms of the various quality uh, of life um, uh, indicators that are uh, shown to be improved um, with uh, patients who engage in therapeutic exercise, um, we actually have this graphic from the American College of Sports Medicine. And basically, in the year 2018, um, they had a big roundtable discussion where they gathered kind of all the major players in, in cancer, including the National Cancer Institute, National Can Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, the American Cancer Society, and then they kind of met with all the big players in phys uh, physical activity. So the um, American Association of Physical Medicine Rehabilitation, um, American Physical Therapy Association, um, and um, the American College of Sports Medicine. So they all kind of got together to um, discuss what kinds of specific guidelines of um, exercise they uh, would want to be giving uh, to patients with cancer. And during that time, they also reviewed all the literature um, that, that's out there um, in terms of um, how does cancer help patients that actually feel better. Um, so as you can see, they um, came up with this graphic um, and they uh, found that there is strong evidence for um, a variety um, 
of, uh, of ailments that um, uh, exercise can absolutely help with. Um, so we uh, can kind of zoom in on the benefits for which there's strong evidence. And we see that we know um, uh, if you have cancer-related fatigue and you exercise regularly, that can be alleviated. Uh, similarly, uh, overall health-related quality of life is improved. Um, physical function um, can uh, obviously uh, be improved, but um, more interesting is that they've also found um, effects uh, on, on mood um, so that patients that engage in uh, regular exercise um, have uh, improvements in uh, anxiety as, as well as depression. And uh, moving on to um, those benefits for which there's moderate evidence. So that basically this means in, in the studies that they reviewed, um, there, the evidence was kind of conflicting, but some of it did show um, that there, there was um, evidence um, in, in helping these different areas. So um, in regards to bone health, uh, they do think, or there at least is some evidence that shows that um, if you engage in kind of more high impact training, um, with uh, vigorous resistance uh, training that your bones can become stronger and more dense. Um, additionally, they, they did find a little bit of evidence showing that um, patients who exercise regularly um, also have uh, benefits um, when, when they're sleeping here. Um, so, so there is a question about, um, is it okay to walk or run or go for runs? So um, we are going to kind of be talking about that in a little bit. Okay. So hopefully that'll be Good. answered in the, in the natural course, but in general, it, it depends um, on you know, your baseline level of activity, um, as well as any kind of pre-existing other medical problems that you might have, um, but we will be talking about that. Um, so if I don't answer it sufficiently in the coming slides, then uh, let me know, we can bring that up again. Um, so it should be noted that all those benefits that we just discussed um, from the American College of Sports Medicine, they were primarily looking at um, studies uh, with uh, breast and prostate cancer patients. And I know that that's something that Dr. Freeland was talking about too. And it just kind of has to do with, you know, the prevalence of certain kinds of cancers. Um, so, you know, the, the kind of more prevalent cancers will be getting um, uh, the, the more research. Um, however, there have been um, a, few st uh, a few studies um, showing exercise and its effects specifically um, for thyroid cancer, um, which, um, does uh, make sense as to you know why they would be recommending these specific exercise guidelines for all cancer patients. Um, so this is a study that I believe they did in Korea, and basically they were looking at the um, effects of a home-based exercise program um, after for in thyroid cancer patients after getting a thyroidectomy. Uh, so they basically looked at um, uh, they had uh, two uh, groups of patients. So one of them. Um, uh, was an exercising group, uh, it, and one of them was a non-exercising group. Um, and in the exercising group, they had them undergo resistance, flexibility, and aerobic exercises three to five days per week for at least 150 minutes per week. And um, throughout, um, they would give them uh, questionnaires um, to kind of assess how their fatigue, anxiety, and overall quality of life was. And what they found was that the group that exercised more had significantly less fatigue, they were significantly less anxious, and they also reported um, uh, significantly improved quality of life over the non-exercising group. Um, um, additionally, this is another small study that they did in uh, Brazil, and they looked um, at the effects of exercise on quality of life um, in, in patients um, with a deep differentiated thyroid carcinoma and subclinical hyperthyroidism. And again, they split them up into two groups and in the exercising group, they had them do aerobic and stretching exercises uh, uh, twice a week for 12 weeks and um, gave them kind of similar questionnaires. And again, the exercise group um, reported overall um, improvement in, in quality of life. Um, so um, what exactly then are the uh, recommendations that the ACSM is putting forth? Um, so specifically what our target is, is 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity aerobic exercise um, in addition to two to three days per week of strength training targeting major muscle groups. So, you know, this isn't any kind of super fancy CrossFit kind of exercise. This is just regular aerobic exercise consisting of um, like brisk walking or jogging or uh, uh, like walking around in a pool. Um, and same thing with the strength training, nothing fancy, but just using either resistance training or, or body weight exercises or just using regular weights um, 
kind of targeting the arms, legs, uh, the back and the chest um, two to three days per week um, is enough to um, kind of achieve these benefits. And doctor, um, there is a question yes. on when, when is it okay to start exercising after having a total thyroidectomy? Yes, that is a great question. Um, so um, in general, <laughs> again, it, it depends um, kind of on your specific situation. Um, so let's say that you know, you're a perfectly um, like healthy individual and you don't have um, any, any other medical problems like coronary or, or like uh, heart disease um, or lung disease. Um, and uh, maybe you were very fit beforehand um, and you, know, you have okay balance and you're pretty strong um, in situations such as that. Um, I would say it would be okay to exercise um, uh, pretty much uh, like almost immediately after you're healed. So um, uh, sometimes your, your surgeon will put um, uh, precautions on you for like a week or two weeks about like what kind of range of motion you can do and how much kind of pressure you can exert on your body. So they may say, you know, you can only lift five pounds or 10 pounds for, you know, the first uh, few weeks after surgery, but that doesn't mean that you can't walk <laughs> um, and kind of engage in, um, in the aerobic component. And then kind of as your surgeon um, lifts those specific barriers, then I would say, you know, assuming you were healthy before and active before, you could, you, yeah, you, you could um, kind of do whatever you want. Um, but uh, I would um, defer um, specifically to um, whatever your specific surgeon's um, restrictions are for you. And once they lift those, um, if you didn't have any pre existing um, medical problems, then you would be okay to, to start exercising. Um, so moving on here, just want to uh, quickly um, uh, contrast the um, American College of Sports Medicine guidelines um, with the guidelines for physical activity from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network. And as we can see, they're basically the same. Um, so they do recommend that um, specific exercise uh, be tailored to um, an individual's abilities and preferences. Um, but again, they are aim you are aiming for that 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity activity or 75 minutes of vi vigorous intensity activity throughout the week. Um, and again, they do uh, mention the resistance training two to three times per week, um, but they also add in that you should be stretching major muscle groups twice a week in addition to uh, just generally uh, uh, avoiding um, prolonged sedentary behavior. Um, so if all that sounds a little bit daunting, if, um, you know, maybe you're not used to exercising um, as much, you know, uh, 115 meets, uh, minutes per week can, can sound like a lot. Um, the uh, NCCN also uh, gives guidelines for um, kind of an initial prescription if you're just starting out. Um, so they recommend um, a frequency of one to three days per week of light to moderate um, intensity training that can be um, aerobic or resistance. And uh, you're trying to reach a goal of, of doing 20 minutes in a single session. Um, so when, the, uh, when all these groups came together and they're coming up with these uh, guidelines and recommendations, um, they you know, obviously knew and recognized that exercise is a great benefit and that we should all really be doing it more. So they didn't um, want to make any kind of barriers um, to uh, patients like feeling free to be able to exercise. So such as you were asking with, when can I exercise after, after surgery? Um, so they recognized that and to that end, they stated that a comprehensive physical fitness assessment before starting exercise may create an unnecessary barrier. Um, so they stated that no assessments are required to start low intensity aerobic training like walking or cycling uh, or resistance training with gradual progression or flexibility program in most patients. Now the key word here is most patients. Um, and they go on to state that medical clearance may still be indicated as previous or as um, described depending on someone's um, fitness level and their health history. And they actually did not um, say who those target populations requiring clearance are themselves, but rather they deferred to um, the guidelines that had already been set in place from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which are shown right here. So I hope this can kind of answer the question about, you know, if it's um, safe to exercise. So we can see that uh, the NCCN kind of breaks up into uh, two patient populations. So in the uh, upper box here, um, we see that if you have peripheral neuropathy or arthritis, different musculoskeletal issues uh, like back pain or poor bone health like osteoporosis or lymphedema, 
then they do recommend um, that a pre-exercise medical evaluation be performed and that the uh, exercise regimen be modified based off of those assessments. Additionally, they also recommend consideration of referral to trained personnel. So that would be either a physical therapist, an exercise physiologist, or a physician like myself um, in um, rehabilitation um, medicine um, in order to kind of supervise your exercise program. Um, uh, so uh, they also have this kind of higher risk population down here. Um, so if you have history of lung surgery, a history of major abdominal surgery, an ostomy, uh, heart disease or COPD, um, ataxia, which is kind of difficulty with um, walking um, um, and with coordination, um, severe fatigue, severe nutritional deficiencies, or a worsening, um, changing physical condition, um, that they do um, indeed recommend that you do have a pre-exercise medical evaluation, and they do recommend clearance by a physician before starting on an exercise program, um, in addition to referral to uh, trained personnel. So again, that's physical therapy, occupational therapy, exercise physiologist, um, or a, a personal trainer who is, um, is uh, um, experienced in, in, in working with um, patients with cancer. So there is a question on, uh, you know, on those days when you're just so fatigued, what do you do? Um, is there some exercise that's recommended or do you just try to walk? Yes. So in general, you should kind of, you know, be, be striving to do as much as you can do. Um, I mean, there will definitely be yeah, days where for whatever reason you're feeling more wiped out and, you know, that's, that's okay. It's, it's okay to take a day off. And I think it's important to recognize that um, the goal um, that, that they state is 150 minutes per week, you generally divided into, you know, three to five sessions, so three to five days per week. So it's okay to, you know, take that day off and to rest and then, you know, um, uh, pick it back up the next day if you're, if you're feeling able to. Um, so if you're feeling really, really tired, that's okay. But if you're feeling like you're not so tired that you, that you can still take a walk, then that's even better. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, of course, all these guidelines were um, established before 2020, and we're just living in a totally different world now. Um, so I think it is important to um, make a comment uh, about COVID. So uh, the CDC does recognize that having cancer increases the risk of severe illness um, from COVID-19, um, meaning increased risk of um, intubation, um, uh, admission to intensive care unit, and mortality. Um, they also state that it is not known whether having a history of cancer increases the risk of severe illness. Um, in light of this, I mean, it's important for all of us to uh, you know, utilize uh, personal protective equipment in addition to maintaining social distancing. But um, really, um, for patients that do have cancer, it, it is really even more important for them to um, kind of abide by those precautions. And that is largely kind of what I tell my uh, patients. So it's not really the greatest time to be going into any kind of setting um, where you might be in close vicinity or contact um, with a bunch of other people with unknown um, kind of unknown illness status. Um, so that would be things like gyms or spas or um, uh, even um, certain physical therapy uh, places if um, it's, it's particularly cramped in there. Um, so for the most part, what I tell my patients is, um, you know, if you can stay at home and stay at home <laughs> and, you know, kind of undergo a supervised exercise program at home. And to that end, a lot of these, you know, gyms, um, as well as um, phys physical therapy facilities are um, starting to go virtual in the services that they provide. So I, I would encourage people to also look for those kinds of resources um, in, in the effort to, you know, engage in physical activity and be safe um, um, and just kind of trying to avoid unnecessary risk as, as much as possible. So uh, just a time check, we have about uh, nine minutes left. Okay, I'm going to kind of maybe rush through the last few slides here. Um, but um, okay, so we talked about the benefits. Um, and uh, we talked about some of the precautions. Uh, lastly, I want to just go over, um, you know, the uh, intensity targets that we're really going for. So in this tiny graphic, you can see at the bottom here kind of outlined in red, um, where they literally define uh, the in intensity targets that we're trying to reach. And if we blow that up, we can see that they define 
moderate intensity exercise is 40 to 59% of heart rate reserve or VO2 reserve, um, and vigorous intensity exercise is 60 to 89% of heart rate reserve or VO2 reserve. So there's probably a lot of questions like what is heart rate reserve and what is VO2 reserve and what is VO2? Um, so uh, before we go into that, I'd like to quickly discuss kind of the old method um, in, in which we would um, kind of track um, target heart rate zones for aerobic activity. So this is a, a table from the American Heart Association. And on the left-hand column, you see kind of the age is lifted out. And on the right-hand column, you see the maximum heart rates. And kind of based off of those two things, they come up with this target heart rate zone, um, which is 50 to 85% of your maximum heart rate. So for a 20-year-old, they get this number 100 by taking 50% of 200. And they get this higher number 170 by taking 85% of 200. And then they kind of apply that to all these different numbers here. And in terms of getting... Um, your maximum heart rate, they use this equation here, where maximum heart rate is 220 minus age. So if we have this gentleman on the left and say that he's 40 years old, we can um, take 220 minus 40, and that would give us a maximum um, estimated heart rate of 180. And uh, his target heart rate would be between 90 and 153. So the problem with this is that it only takes into account your age and does not take into account an individual's fitness level. So somebody who leads a more sedentary lifestyle um, necessarily is not going to be the same as somebody who runs marathons regularly. And that's a common criticism uh, of this approach. So to that end, um, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine actually recommends that we um, go based off of heart rate reserve. Now heart rate reserve, you can kind of think about as uh, your heart's potential to beat faster or how much faster it's able to be beyond its um, normal resting rate. Um, so the actual equation is your maximum heart rate minus your um, resting heart rate. And as we discussed before, um, we have the equation for the uh, maximum heart rate, uh, whereas uh, the resting heart rate, you could just kind of measure yourself um, you know, after sitting down, um, you just take your own pulse, or if you have one of those fancy fitness watches, then you know, that can uh, tell you what your resting heart rate is also. Um, so um, in this example, we kind of plug in all these numbers for our 40 year old who will assume has a resting heart rate of 70 and plugging all these numbers in, we see that his heart rate reserve is 110. So then to actually calculate um, the upper and lower bounds of what his um, heart rate should be while exercising, we use this uh, formula called the Carbonian formula. And basically um, we kind of plug in all these numbers. I won't go through all this now, but if you do all of it, um, and then we see that his target heart rate for moderate intensity exercise should be between 114 and 135, which we see is a much narrower range than what we saw with the old formula. Um, so really this is a method um, um, which ensures that you know, you're working hard enough, but also not working you know, harder than you need to be. <laughs> um, so similarly, um, we'll quickly go over VO2. So VO2 basically is the volume of oxygen that your body is consuming um, during um, any kind of activity. Um, and it's measured in milliliters per minute per kilogram of body weight. And um, uh, basically uh, they, they use it as a metric for or telling how fit someone is. So the actual process of obtaining um, someone's VO2 max is extremely laborious and difficult and no one's ever gonna do this. Kind of illustrated in this left-hand lower uh, corner image here where you see this person on the treadmill um, attached to like this fighter jet kind of mask. Um, that's measuring literally their oxygen intake. Um, uh, fortunately, um, if you are interested in uh, knowing what your VO2 max, you wouldn't have to necessarily go through that. Um, a lot of these new fitness devices, this is the Garmin watch, this is a Garmin fitness tracker, this is uh, the Apple Series 6 watch. Um, they do um, estimate VO2 max. Um, and for those who are interested, you can calculate um, what your VO2 reserve would be by um, knowing your VO2 max through one of those methods and then subtracting the resting VO2, which is largely considered to be 3.5 um, for most individuals. And we do have a couple of questions, yes. uh, doctor. One, one is uh, about outdoor lap swimming mm -hmm. during COVID, but you know, if there's people outside of your household that are using the same pool, is that considered safe? So that is a really good question. If you don't know, I mean, my base instinct, and if you were my patient, and, you know, of course, it, it would kind of depend on, um, you know, your, your status, are you actively on chemotherapy, um, or are you in complete remission, did you kind of finish a long time ago, um, you know, it, it, that would kind of make you fall into, into different um, risk categories. Um, 
but my, my gut instinct is to say uh, avoid it, especially if you don't know who is going in and out of the pool and how often it's being cleaned. And um, it, that would be my instinct. And then how about a uh, daily yoga? Is that a good benefit for someone with thyroid cancer? So yes, yoga is absolutely a great benefit for thyroid cancer. And we're going to be talking about that in a little bit too. Um, but yes, yoga is an absolutely wonderful thing to do. <laughs> and another person said they're just having trouble getting started after surgery. Um, they used to love playing tennis and they tried and it just, they just don't feel right, feel off. Um, any, any, uh, advice on what to do to just get restarted? Um, so kind of those NCCN guidelines that we talked about, so, you know, assuming that you're healthy and you don't fall into kind of one of those risk populations, um, and you don't need uh, a physical evaluation, um, prior to, prior to, um, getting started on an exercise program, uh, you could definitely start yourself based off of just those, um, initial prescription NCCN guidelines, kind of. Uh, lower intensity, light intensity, one to three sessions per week. Um, uh, certainly, if you know it's kind of like an issue of like just getting yourself up and out. Um, there are a lot of different uh, programs out there um, for um, patients with cancer trying to increase their level of physical activity. Um, um, so probably the most uh, popular one is like Live Strong. Um, I think that was uh, Lance Armstrong's program. Um, but in, in addition to that, there, there are several more. And if you kind of contact um, your local gyms or um, oftentimes um, physical therapy centers associated with hospital settings, a lot of times they'll also have um, kind of exercise. Um, not, not, it's not super common, but if it's a larger kind of hospital, then they may um, have a, a program that can uh, help with the conditioning um, of, um, of patients with cancer um, that is uh, typically supervised by a physical therapist or an exercise physiologist. Okay, so just to finish up here, so this is probably a lot more math than you were expecting to hear um, in, in a webinar about exercise. Um, so you're probably wondering, is there another, another way to see if you are working hard enough? And yes, the answer is that there is. Um, so um, uh, this is the Borg scale of perceived exertion developed by uh, Dr. Gunnar Borg. And basically, um, uh, uh, he, you, you want to be at this level of what is called bo a board rating of 13 to 14, which is somewhat hard. And this is basically a level at which you're breathing a little bit harder, but you're not um, completely out of breath. And the NCCN um, also recognizes this. And um, to that end, they um, uh, kind of give these um, examples of what uh, light exercise, moderate exercise, and vigorous exercise um, should all be. And for our, our uh, person to ask the yoga question, we can see that yoga is considered both light, moderate, and vigorous intensity exercise. So, you know, what does that mean? What are we supposed to make of that? Um, but really, um, when we're thinking about that level of perceived exertion, it, it's really focusing on your breathing weight, right? So light exercise, um, you shouldn't have any noticeable change in your breathing pattern. Um, for moderate exercise, you should be at a point, you should be working at a point where you can talk, but you cannot sing. And if you're doing vigorous activity, you should be able to say a few words without stopping to catch a breath, but you should not be able to do more than that. So going based off of these things, you can be relatively well assured that you are in those target heart rates, um, which will um, kind of achieve for you um, those benefits that we discussed earlier. And in general, you know, it's all about maintaining kind of like a healthy lifestyle. Um, so, you know, aside from, you know, your the regular or, um, engaging in, in um, a structured um, exercise program, um, you uh, want to just be walking and mobile as much as you can. So, you know, take the stairs, park in the back of the parking lot, and just set yourself up to be more physically active. Um, so I think I made it through and uh, we're, happy and, yeah, we're actually, we're actually um, slightly over time. Um, and we do, we do have to kind of clear out the Zoom rooms to get ready for the next session. Um, so doc, I'll ask you to do me a favor and, and give me back the, um, the host control so that I can officially end um, sure. that, just a couple questions while we're doing that. Uh, for those patients that have some lung metastases and some difficulty breathing, how do they adjust these goals for their abilities? So yeah, it, it's, it's all about decreasing the intensity um, as well as the length of time. Um, as well as basically you, you want to be going to, you, you want to be working out to an intensity where 
you're not overtly symptomatic, especially if you're having difficulty breathing. So mm -hmm. it's really by adjusting intensity um, and frequency. Awesome. Um, well, thank you so much.